Okay, so we're going to talk about elementary functions, graphs, and transformations. So first thing we're going to do is look at some basic graphs. We've got the identity function. That's basically where y equals to x. A square function. That's our basic parabola. The cubed function. Square root function. A cube root function and the absolute value function. Those are the basic graphs that we'll be looking at as far as transforming. And for the most part, we'll look at um, parabolas. <clears throat> now, we can manipulate um, these functions by shifting, stretching, and shrinking. And in this chart on your handout, you can um, see the basic way that the graphs will um, transform. And a lot of it depends on whether it's the plus or minus C is on the outside of the function or if it's inside the function. And again, if it's outside, if it's inside, and then this would be the vertical stretching is going to be on the outside and the horizontal will be on the inside. So all of the vertical shifts will be on the outside of the function and the inside the functions will cause horizontal shifts. And sometimes they go the way we think they will, and sometimes they go opposite of what we think. So a vertical shift, if we let the function and C um, be a positive real number, then the graph has shifted C units vertically up and down. So we can see here on our graph that plus C will make the graph go up with a minus C it drops it down. So our first example that we're going to look at is on your handout, but I'm going to go ahead and um, show you how this works. We've got three functions. We've got f of x equals x squared, g of x equals x squared plus 2, and h of x equals x squared minus 3. So I am going to um, draw these out. <clears throat> so this will be example one. And the first thing we're looking at is f of x is equal to x squared. And I basically want to graph this. So I'm going to make a t-chart. x, y. And then I'm going to pick 0, 1, and 1 because it's easy to graph an x squared if we use these three digits for our x. And when we plug those in, negative 1 squared, remember it's the whole thing squared, will get you 1. 0 squared is 0, and 1 squared will be 1. <clears throat> the next graph that we will look at will be our g of x equal to x squared plus 2. Now I'm going to pick the same values for my x. So negative 1, 0, and 1. So we can see what's happening to the graph. And when I plug that in, we get negative 1 squared plus 2. Well, that's going to get us 1 plus 2 will get us 3. And then 0 squared plus 2 will get us 0 plus 2 is 2. And then 1 squared plus 2 is 1 plus 2 will get us 3 again. And then the last graph that we will uh, look at will be h of x equal to x squared minus 3. So again, we're going to pick some values. We're going to plug them in the same way that we have on the previous ones. So negative 1, 0, and 1 negative 1 squared minus 3, but well, that'll get us 1 minus 3 is negative 2. 0 squared minus 3 will get us negative 3, and then 1 squared minus 3 will get us 1 minus 3, which is again negative 2. So now that we have all of the points, we're going to graph this on the same grid so that we can see what happens to our graph. Now, the top part of our graph, we, um, we're going to use the same x values. If you notice, they didn't change. 
and we're going to have ones and then twos and threes and negative twos and negative threes. So we just got to make sure we have enough hash marks. So I am going to put three on each part of our axis. All right, the very first one, the first graph, plots at our three points. So this is the f of x graph. Our second graph <clears throat> plots at negative one, positive three. And then zero, two, and then one, three. So this is our g of x. It's here. And then here we have negative 1, negative 2, and 0, negative 3, and also we have 1, negative 2. And this is our h of x graph. So remember, we talked at the very beginning about if it's happening on the outside of the function, then it's making it go vertical. So our, func our parent function of f of x equals x squared has gotten moved up and down. And it does exactly what you think. You add two, it's going up. Minus three, it goes down. All right, so let's go look at some vertical stretching and shrinking graphs. So this kind of shows you what's going to happen with the vertical stretching and shrinking. And we're also going to look at some horizontal shifts. So if we're looking at our graph right here, for vertical stretching and shrinking, this is where it's either greater than 1 or it's less than 1. Depends on what happens with the graph. <coughs> but notice that the x values stay put. What happens is the graph, when it gets multiplied by a value, it stretches up. If it's a whole number, it's greater than 1. It doesn't have to be whole. It just has to be greater than 1. And then if we have something that is between 0 and 1, it's going to get closer to the x-axis. It's going to shrink, but the x values stay in the same place. And we can see an example of this where here is our graph. And when it gets multiplied by a 1 half, the graph kind of gets pushed down and it gets a little bit um, kind of uh, moved back towards the x-axis. So here was our original point, and then went from negative 8 down to negative 4. So it gets pushed towards the x-axis. The other thing we're going to look at and then do an example with is horizontal shifts. So here is our function. It's happening inside. If we add c, this is where it kind of goes opposite of what you think. When you add C, it will move towards the left. And when you subtract C, it will move towards the right. And we're going to go do example two, which you can see is on your handout. So you can see we've got our parent function and our graph is going to shift um, to the left and to the right. All right, so example two. So our first function will be f of x equals 2x squared. Our second function will be g of x is equal to x plus 2 squared. And our h of x will be equal to x minus 3 squared. All right, so we've already done the t-chart previously, but I'm going to put it here again. Negative 1, 0, and 1 will get us 1, 0, and 1 when we plug it into our function. This time, we've got our x and our y, and we're again going to plug in negative 1, 0, and 1, and we'll get 1, 4, and 9 when we plug it in, because negative 1 plus 2 will get us 1 and 1 squared is 1. 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. 
1 plus 2 is 3, 3 squared is 9. So this works just like we did before. And then for our h of x, we'll have negative 1, 0, and 1 again. And when we plug in those values, we're going to get really big numbers, 16, 9, and 4. So on both of these, what we need is to find where the y is equal to 0. Because that way, it'll make it easy um, to graph it on our x-axis. So to get 0 here, I need to plug in a negative 2. Because negative 2 plus 2 will get us 0. So I'm going to choose to do negative 2. And then 0 squared will get us 0. And on this one, to get to 0, I need 3. Because 3 minus 3 will get us 0. And that will get us our zero there. Okay. And then I'm also going to choose to do a two. So I get the number right next to it. And if I plug in two, two minus three will be negative one. Negative one squared will get us one. All right. So let's go draw our graph again. Again, we don't need really big numbers. We have some bigger numbers, but we really won't need those big numbers. Because we can get to our graphing a little bit easier with that. All right, so our again, our initial function. It will look like this. This is our f of x still. And then our x plus 2, we're going to be at negative 1, 1. So we're kind of landing at the same spot right there. At negative 2, 0. So we're going to be here. And remember, our little parent function has like a little bit of symmetry going on. And so we know that... If we plug in 3, or negative 3, we would also get another 1. So that kind of helps us graph, and this would be our g of x. And then for this function on this side, our h of x, when we, um, we will be at 3, 0. And at 2, we'll hit 1. And we'll also, if we plugged in 4, we would also get a 1. So you can see when you plug in the numbers what actually happens with our graphs. They are going to shift along. All right. So the next problem we're going to look at will be a square root function. So f of x equals the square root of x. And we're just going to do one other function of g of x equals the square root of x plus 5. <clears throat> now, this time for our x's, we need to choose numbers that we can take the square root of. Definitely cannot take the square root of a negative number. But we can plug in 0 and get 0 because the square root of 0 is 0. We could choose 1 again if we choose. We could do a 1. So square root of 1 is 1. And then let's pick 4. Square root of 4 will get us 2. So just plugging our x values into our function gets us our y values. And then over here, we need to pick numbers that will get us a value that we can take the square root of. So we have our x and we have our y. If I put in negative 5, negative 5 plus 5 will get me 0. Square root of 0 is 0. Then, and then I've got to figure out another way to get a number I could take the square root of. Now remember, we could take square root of 4. So if I plug in... Um, a number to get a 4 here as a total. So negative 1 plus 
5 would get me 4. Square root of 4 is 2. And then if we want a third number, we could. We could plug in 4. 4 plus 5 is 9. Square root of 9 would get us 3. So um, you really just need to at least have two points to do the graph because it's a square root. All right, so let's draw our graph. And put in some hash marks. All right, so on our first part here, we're at 0, 0, 1, 1, and at 4, we are at 2. So that helps us create our square root graph. And on our second graph, where it, again, this is inside the function because it's underneath the radical with the x. So it's going to horizontally shift back and forth. So we have negative 5, 0. And we have negative 1 and 2. And then if we wanted to continue on, we could do 4 and 3. But we're just going to sketch our graph here. We're just doing a basic graph. All right. So now let's look at horizontal. Um, <coughs> and you can see the graph as well on your handout. Horizontally stretching and shrinking. Now remember on the vertical graphs, the x values stayed put, and it was the y's that went up and down. On the horizontal, um, where it's been on the inside of the function, the stretching and shrinking, the y values stay the same. It's the x values that move. So they move closer in or come close farther out. And you can see that with both of the graphs. So that's what's going to change um, with the horizontal. You can see that here is our graph and the um, graph shape is the same except now it's gotten pushed together. So it's shrinking horizontally or it's being going to be stretched horizontally. Those are the two things that will happen. The other thing that can happen is we can reflect about the x-axis and reflect about the y-axis. So this is if we have like a negative x squared, it'll flip over. And this would be like a negative cubed function is where it will rotate around the origin on there. So let's go um, do some examples where we are. Going to combine our horizontal and vertical shifts. So we are going to start again with our parent function of x squared. And then we are going to change our function to h of x equals x plus 1 squared minus 3. And you should be able to look at what's happening to the function and tell me what's happening with words. So you should be able to describe it. So x plus 1, because it's inside of the function, we know that it will be a horizontal and we need to be able to tell from looking at it, is it going to go left or is it going to go right? And because it's plus one, it's going to go left. So it will be left one and then the minus three, which is outside the function, will be a vertical going up and down because it's a negative three. It will go down three. So that would be how you would explain to me, word-wise, what happens to the function. So we're going to go back to just graphing our basic f of x, which we've gra uh, graphed our f of x equals x squared, graphed several times. So that is where we hit that negative 1, 0, and 1. It's a basic function. And now we're going to go left, 1, and down 3 for each of our points. So instead of making a t-chart, 
we're going to go left one and down three for each of our points and go left one and down one, two, three and left one and down one, two, three. And notice that we still end up with our basic three points on our graph. It just gets shifted. All right, let's go to example five. We still have our basic function of x squared, and it won't always be that. It's just an easy one um, to show you so that you understand what's happening with the graph itself. And you can graph these on a calculator to also look at them, but as you are noticing, it's not that hard to do the little bit of graphing that is required. Because these are just sketches. And then sometimes you'll just be given a graph on um, a piece of paper and um, that's already graphed and you're going to um, just move the graph just like we're doing here. All right, so with x minus two, again, it's gonna be a horizontal shift and because it's negative two, it's going to go right two and the plus four will go up four. So we'll graph our basic function again and then we'll shift each of our points, right two, up four. So over two and up one, two, three, four and over two, and up four, and over two, and up four. And there is our graph. All right, our next graph, we'll still start with f of x equal to x squared, and our g of x, is equal to negative x squared, which we should be able to understand that's the opposite of our function. It's the negative of our original function of f of x. You don't really need to know that part. I just like to add what I can into the knowledge base when we're doing stuff. So this tells us the graph is going to reflect. We don't need a lot of points on this graph because it's not really shifting other than it's going to um, flip. So we're drawing our basic function, and then when it flips, all of the points will flip over. So basically, it's going to graph upside down. So that's what the negative will do. And then we can also do the same thing with a negative x cubed. So if our f of x is equal to x cubed and our g of x is equal to negative x cubed, we'll draw a basic graph and we don't need a lot of hash marks again, because our basic x cubed function is going to graph here, here, and here, because if you plug in your one and your negative one, that's what's gonna happen with it. And it's got a little bit of a curve to it. I and mean, you can go back to the very first page we looked at to kind of get an idea for it, but it kind of curves through. So that's our f of x, that is x cubed, and if it's being negated, it's going to go the other way. And that'll be the one in the blue. All right. So let's look at some graphs where we do a little bit more on them here, we have example eight, and we're again just gonna start with our basic function, and we're going to graph g of x equals to negative two x plus three squared minus three. 
So let's talk about what's going to happen with our graph. First, inside of our parent function, that means we're going to go left 3. Then we're going to multiply by 2. We're going to flip the graph because of the negative. And then the negative 3 will tell us that we will go down 3. That's kind of the order in which we're going to change the function. Trying to make it the easiest we can. You can do it all at once if you would like to. All right, let's see if that's enough hash marks for us. So our original function again is our x squared. Now we're going to shift our start shifting our graph. We're going to go over three, left three. So we'll go one, two, three. So our starting point is here and we're going to multiply by two. So that means instead of it being like at the one negative one, it would be at um, for those x values, they're going to get doubled on the y. So the y is at 1. Now because it's multiplied by 2, the y will be at 2. So we're still going one way on either side, but we're going to stretch them up. So it'll be at negative, or at the 2. And I'm going to draw it in with um, dashed lines because this isn't exactly where it's going to stop. Then I'm going to flip it, so I'm going to come down, and on either side, I'm going to be two below. So it's kind of coming along like this, and then we'll move it down three. So we'll go down one, two, three. So right there, and then we know that it comes off either part, but because it got multiplied by two, it'll be two away. And that would be your final graph. All right, let's go do another one of these. We have example nine. F of X equals X squared. And H of X equals three times X minus two squared plus four. <clears throat> so on this graph, we're gonna go right to we're going to multiply by 3, and we're going to go up 4. So let's draw our graph. I put about 5 hash marks on each one. We'll start with our basic function, and then we're going to go right to, so we're right here, and then multiplying by 3, that means instead of y being 1, y will be at 3. So again, we're going to go over 1, but then go up 3 marks. So that gives us our basic sketch of what our graph is. And then we're going to move it up four. So we'll go up one, two, three, four. And I need to add some more hash marks here because I don't have enough. And we'll go up one, two, three. And that's where our graph will land. All right, the next type of graph that we're going to talk about are piecewise functions, and they are defined by two or more equations over a specified domain. So here is an example of Fujita scale. The Fujita scale is what they use to measure tornadoes. So you can see by the difference in the wind speeds, it tells you if it's going to be um, what kind of, an, of a tornado, an F1, an F2, 3, 4, or 5. So that's one type of piecewise function. And basically a piecewise function has more than one piece. 
to it. This would be the graph of the F1 tornadoes, where you can see um, that it goes from one part to the next. All right, so we are going to evaluate a piecewise function. So if we are given f of x is equal to 4x plus 2 if x is less than 0 and 4x plus 3 if x is greater than or equal to 0. So we have two parts to our piecewise function. And depending on what values you have, you have to decide, does it use the top part or does it use the second part of the function? So we'll have three parts that we're going to look at here. So part A, we want to look at f at negative two. So we have to decide which part will we use in the function? Well, we have to take our negative two and say, is negative two less than zero or is it greater than or equal to zero? Well, negative two is less than zero, so that tells us we will use 4x plus two. And then we'll plug in the value. So four, x is equal to negative two plus two. Well, four times negative two is negative eight plus two. That'll get us negative six. All right. Let's look at our next part, part B. If we're looking for f at zero. <clears throat> so I have to come back up here. Is it less than zero or is it greater than or equal to zero? Because it's equal to zero, we're gonna use the bottom part. So we'll use four x plus three. So four times zero plus three will get us zero plus three, which is equal to three. And then our third part is F at three. Well, three is not less than zero. It is greater than or equal to zero. So again, we'll use the bottom part. You at, use four X plus three. So that'll get us four times three plus three, because we're plugging again our value of x. So that gets us 12 plus three, which equals 215. And that's how you're going to evaluate a function. You just have to choose which one you're going to use and then use that part. All right, let's look at example 11. So f of x is equal to 3x if x is less than or equal to zero and two if x is greater than zero. So again, we need to graph both functions. So I'm not gonna give us specific ones, we're just gonna graph both parts because with this one, we're gonna graph the function itself. And the easiest way to graph this will be to pick some values. So we have to do values for both parts of the graph. So for our f of x equal to 3x, we're just going to pick some values. But we have to go over here and look. They have to be less than or equal to 0. So that means we use 0, negative 1, and let's do negative 2 because they have to be zero or less than. When we plug zero in, three times zero is zero. Three times negative one will be negative three, and three times negative two is negative six. And then we also need to do our f of x is equal to two. So this is for values that are greater than zero. And no matter what the value is, it's just going to be two. There is no x to plug in, but we have to be greater than zero. So for our x, y greater than zero, we'll start with one, two, and three. There's nothing to plug in because the value of the function is just two, not two x. 
so it'll just be two for every point that you you choose. All right, so let's go over here and graph our function. Put on some hash marks. So for our very first function, we start at 0, 0, then we have negative 1, negative 3, so we're just plotting the points of the graph, and negative 2, negative 6. So we are graphing that part, just comes on down. And then the second part of our function is at 1, 2, 2, 2. 3, 2, and it keeps on going. And But our graph can also be less than uh, 1, but it has to be greater than 0. So what we'll do is put an open circle right there on our value, and then we'll draw our line going this way. Because it can go all the way up to 0, it just can't include the 0. Because the 0 is graphed down here. So that would be what the graph looks like. And then the next part of our graph is part B, is we need to find the range. So our range will still start from here. Remember, what, that's the y values. It's going to start at negative infinity. It'll go all the way up to 0, negative infinity to 0. Infinities never get brackets. They're always parentheses, and the zero will get a bracket because it closes at the zero, and then we'll have a union, and it's just going to be two because that's the y value. So we'll just put two in curly brackets, and that would be the range found on our um, piecewise function. All right, so the next problem that we're going to do will be example 12. And example 12 is on our handout. I have since changed the number on example 12. It is um, not, it's five on this one, but it's now number 12 on there. Um, so a retail chain sells DVD players. The retail price, P of X in dollars, and the weekly demand for a particular model are related by this P of X function where 9 is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 289. We're going to describe how the graph of the function can be obtained, and then we're going to sketch the graph. All right. So things we're going to write down are the important parts. So our p of x function equals 115 minus 4 square roots of x, and then it goes from 9 to 289. Those are the boundaries of which we are told it's going to work. So for part A, we have to um, describe how the graph of the function can be obtained from one of the basic functions. Well, the first thing we're going to notice here is that we have a square root of x. So that tells us it's going to go um, similar to a square root function. So similar to square root function. And from there, um, and we can go back and look at the boxes on the handout. So because it has a square root, it's going to be something that looks like this. Okay, not exactly like it, but it will look similar to it. The other thing we can do is look at our um, function here. And if we just look at the part with the radical, because we have a 4 on the outside of the square root, that tells us that um, it's going to do something, and also that the negative on the outside is going to do something. Well, the negative is going to flip the graph. That's always going to be the easier part. And the 4, because it's on the outside, it's going to do a vertical thing. Remember, the inside will do the horizontal. 
And because it's being multiplied by something greater than one, then we know it's going to stretch it. So the four stretches the graph vertically. And then the 115, that's a positive number on the outside, is going to raise it up. So the 115 raises the graph up. So that kind of gives us an idea of what's happening, going to happen with our basic graph. And then part B, we are going to sketch our graph. So we need to pick some points and the points need to be between nine and 289 because that's where we're told the function is lying in the values. So we're gonna make an XY chart and we'll pick nine. We need um, things that we can take a square root of. So nine is one of them. Um, I'm gonna pick 100 as a point and then um, 289 is a square root. It is the perfect square. The square root is going to be 17. All right. So now what we need to do is plug in those values into what we've got going up here. So we've got 115 minus 4 times the square root of 9. As we work this down, and you could plug this all in a calculator if you want to, or you can work it down piece by piece, you will get 103. And then 115 minus 4 times the square root of 100 will get you 75. And then 115 minus 4 times the square root of 289 will get you 47. And like I said, you can plug it in and take it all the way over to get those same values. Or you can put it in the calculator. All right. So then what we need to do is graph our function. Now this graph is a little bit different because we are graphing just that first quadrant of our graph. And we need the nine, we'll start at zero for both, nine, 100, about 200, and 289. And then we're going to go up. This would be 25, 50, 75, and then 100. And then we go a little bit above it for our actual point. So we are at nine, we are at 103, so about right there. And then at 100, we're at 75. And then at 289, we're at 47, so just below 50. And then this time we don't do arrows because we're between nine and 289, so we're not gonna say it extends. We're just going to kind of stretch our graph that way. And it looks like the shape of the um, square root function, except it's flipped over. And that's the end of our section.